There were few reasons to celebrate New Year's Eve on December the 31st, 1916. The passing of the old year offered little prospect of change. At the beginning of 1917, the war in Europe was as stagnant as it had been for the past two years. The Western Front now snaked all the way from the Belgian coast down to the Swiss border. There had been various attempts to break the deadlock, usually by the British and French forces, but neither side had made any significant gains. But 1917 was to be a crucial year, which changed the course of the war. The year was barely two weeks old when a telegram was intercepted and deciphered by British intelligence. Its contents were incendiary, as it proposed an alliance between Germany and Mexico to keep the United States out of the war. But it had the opposite effect. It was a key moment, and one that played a decisive role in bringing the United States into the war against Germany, leading to her eventual defeat. In film director Sam Mender's much acclaimed movie, 1917, it is the delivery of a vital message in a race against time that provides the film's thread. If the messengers succeed, many lives will be saved. The film is a drama, and although the main characters are fictitious, the film is set during an often overlooked moment during the First World War that was to prove pivotal to its eventual outcome. During 1916, the Germans had fought two colossal sustained battles on the Somme and at Verdun. Although both sides experienced spiralling casualties, there seemed little prospect of a decisive outcome. In view of these perceived failings, the German chief of the general staff, Erich von Walkenhayn, was replaced in August 1916 by Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, assisted by his deputy, Erich Ludendorff. Both men brought a fresh assessment to Germany's situation, and it was not looking good. They recognized that Germany did not have the resources or manpower to fight another series of major battles like the year just passed. Although the Germans had attacked the French at Verdun with the aim of bleeding France white, it seemed that it was the German armies that were slowly losing their strength. The fighting on the Somme had left the Germans with two bulges or salients in their lines, which tied up ten divisions in their defence. On their arrival, Hindenburg and Ludendorff authorised the building of a new defensive line that would see a straightening out of these two bulges. The plan was codenamed Operation Alprich. In it, the Germans planned to pull back from their forward positions to specially prepared new defences. By flattening out the two salients, the move would shorten their line by some 25 miles, as well as free up all the divisions tied up in their defence. The withdrawal began in February 1917 and lasted a month. Behind them they left a wasteland. Anything which could or might have some military value was destroyed. As the British cautiously advanced into the territory vacated by the Germans, they found empty ruins of villages and towns. The male populations, who were fit enough, had been transported away to work in factories, supporting the German war effort. Behind, they left women and children and old men with meagre rations to fend for themselves as best they could in their ruined villages. In the film, the two messengers, Blake and Schofield, find themselves in an almost alien landscape. Eerily abandoned deep trenches give way to abandoned farms. The First World War is often characterised as being static and immobile, and yet a central theme of both the movie and the actual events that form its backdrop is one of great fluidity. In the movie, after Blake is killed, Schofield continues the quest alone and finds himself in a burning town 
called Ekou Saman. In real life, a village of the same name suffered a similar fate. Like the two protagonists, the British and French forces only tentatively moved forward, unsure of what lay before them. But with planning for a major new offensive already in its final stages, there was a reluctance to seize the initiative and potentially catch the Germans off balance as they withdrew. It was perhaps a missed opportunity. Poor communications had a part to play. Indeed, in the movie, it is because there is no other means of communicating the order to abandon the attack that Blake and Schofield are selected to carry the message. The use of runners was not unusual, although it was only one of several methods used. Messages were usually passed via field telephones, but cables could be cut by artillery fire and laying replacements could be risky for the signalers sent out into no man's land to lay the new cables. As wireless communication was in its infancy, other methods relying on visual techniques were used, ranging from flags to lamps. Animals were also conscripted into the war effort. Dogs could run fast and carry messages, as well as first aid packs and other small essential items. And carrier pigeons were also used. Hindenburg and Ludendorff knew that they were in a race against time. They knew that the British and French would mount a major new offensive in the spring. But they also knew that it was looking increasingly likely that the United States would enter the war, even though public opinion was still divided. In a move intended to strangle Britain's Atlantic supply lines, Germany announced that from February the 1st, it would resume unrestricted submarine warfare. This meant that all shipping, civilian and merchant, regardless of which flag they sailed under, was a target. At the same time, new German bombers were to open a new front by bombing British cities. The aim was to break down civilian morale, as well as force the British to hold back fighters from the Western Front for defensive duties. Both plans were to backfire badly. In an extraordinary twist, a message between the German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmermann and his ambassador to Mexico was intercepted by British intelligence. It proposed a military alliance in which Germany would fund a Mexican attempt to seize Texas and Arizona. Public outrage following publication of the telegram's contents at the end of January was compounded after Zimmermann publicly confirmed its authenticity. Rarely has a single piece of intelligence had such an impact on world events. Any substantial lingering hesitancy to enter the war evaporated during the following weeks after German U-boats sank two unarmed American ships. On April the 16th, Congress voted to declare war on Germany. Although the US Army was tiny compared to the European armies, she had a vast manufacturing capability that was yet to be put on a war footing. Command of the American Expeditionary Force was given to General John Blackjack Pershing, who firmly resisted early attempts by the British and French commanders to use American units to replace their own losses. He also insisted that his troops were properly trained before being committed to any major campaigns. By June, around 17,000 troops had arrived in France. A year later, there would be over a million men and their contribution would prove decisive to the war's outcome. The US forces used British and French equipment. 
They particularly appreciated artillery pieces like the Trident tested 75mm field gun and the Renault FT light tanks. The aviation units forged a fearsome reputation flying SPAD 13s and Newport 28s. By the end of the war, the American Expeditionary Force had become a modern, battle-tested army. Despite these developments, 1917 was the fourth year of the war, and it was to see more carnage and destruction. For some, it had become too much to bear and mutiny was in the air. The French army was all but paralyzed by mutinies. But the most catastrophic mutiny of all occurred in the Russian army. Russia, which was fighting on the Eastern Front, had suffered several large defeats and enormous numbers of casualties. Food and fuel were in short supply and the general lack of success was leading to dissension at home. Dissatisfied with the army's conduct of the war, Tsar Nicholas took direct personal command in September 1915. But the defeats kept coming. As Nicholas was now in direct command, he was consequently blamed. His popularity was dwindling. As a result, there were massive strikes and riots in cities throughout Russia. By late 1916, even loyalists within the Duma, the Russian parliament, warned the Tsar that revolution was in the air. Even so, Nicholas refused to sanction further constitutional reform. But in February 1917, he made one bad miscalculation too many. Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg, was the capital of the Russian Empire. By the beginning of 1917, there was civil unrest due to food shortages whipped up by the Bolsheviks. In response, Nicholas issued the order to suppress the disturbance only for the garrison to mutiny and join the rioters. The unrest spread until Nicholas II was persuaded to abdicate on the 15th of March 1917. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George reluctantly accepted a proposal for the Tsar and his family to find sanctuary in Britain. But the offer was withdrawn under the direction of King George V who did not wish to be associated with his autocratic cousin at this point of the war. The royal family was then moved to the Siberian city of Ekaterinburg by the Bolsheviks, where they were executed on the night of 16th of July, 1918. The new Russian government did not do much better. A large attack on the German army soon turned into yet another failure. As a result, the entire Russian army began to mutiny and walk away from the trenches. Entire army groups left and hundreds of thousands of soldiers deserted. For Russia, the Great War was essentially over, although a cruel and vicious civil war was about to begin. The collapse of the Russian army allowed Germany to begin moving its troops to the Western Front to face England and France. With the additional manpower, Hindenburg and Ludendorff began planning for one more throw of the dice before the Americans were ready to attack. Planning began for a large offensive to try and knock the British out of the war in the spring of 1918. The collapse of the Russian army did not stop the Allies planning their own spring offensive. 
Robert Nivelle had succeeded Joffre as commander-in-chief of the French army in December 1916. He believed in aggressive tactics and had introduced the innovative use of a carefully timed creeping barrage of artillery fire. The tactic had proved successful in lifting the siege at Verdun in 1916, and he hoped to repeat the success on the Western Front in 1917. The idea was that artillery would aim its fire to land just in front of the infantry as they advanced. It was a technique that required practice and good lines of communication. But as the telephone lines were often cut in such barrages, it was not unknown for the advancing infantry to be cut down by their own artillery. Although Nivelle was aware of the German withdrawal to the Hindenburg Line and the collapse of the Russian army, he refused all advice to change his plan. He assured the politicians that he would break through within a week. The main battle of the Nivelle Offensive was fought on the Aisne from the 16th of April. It was an unmitigated disaster for the French army. A hugely costly attack involving 1.2 million troops and 17,000 guns achieved little in the way of territorial gain. For the French soldiers, it was one failure too many. 19 divisions of the French 5th and 6th Armies went into battle along an 80-kilometre front from Soissons to Rennes, after a week of diversionary attacks by the British. Opposite, the Germans occupied high ground that was heavily defended and fortified. On April the 16th, the first day of the offensive, the French suffered 40,000 casualties alone. A similar disaster to that suffered by the British on the first day of the Somme the previous year. The large-scale use of French-built light tanks brought little advantage, with 150 lost on the first day. Ironically, in the attacks on the 16th and 17th, Nivelle's own innovation, the creeping barrage, was incorrectly deployed, leading to increased French casualties as the infantry advanced without protection. French losses were significant, with 187,000 casualties. The Germans suffered an estimated 168,000 losses. French morale collapsed as the casualties mounted. To make matters worse, the French medical service all but collapsed under the pressure, leading to delays in evacuating the wounded. The French soldiers had had enough. Discontent had spread throughout the army and some 30,000 men decided to leave their trenches and walk home. Many men had not been home in the three years since the war had begun. Officers were allowed to go home on a regular basis, but lowly privates were not given these privileges. Even British soldiers got home more often than the French troops, even though they were fighting in their own country. In addition to the men who left the trenches, some 54 divisions, about half of the French army, refused to obey orders from their commanding officers. The collapse in discipline spread panic through the French high command and government. If the army quit fighting, then the war would be lost and all the sacrifices made would have been for nothing. Reaction was quick on the part of the high command Several older generals were quickly replaced, and a new overall commander was selected. General Pétain, who had fought several successful battles, was chosen to lead the army. He immediately took charge of the situation. Mass arrests were made of all the leaders of the mutiny. 24,000 men were tried and found guilty, and 400 were sentenced to death. But only 50 were shot, while the rest had their sentences commuted. Pétain also implemented a number of improvements, better food, 
home leaves and periods of rest were put into effect. After six weeks of mutiny, discipline in the French army had been restored. But there had been a dramatic change. It was clear that the French army would fight to defend their country, but could no longer be relied on to take an offensive role. This meant that the British and the Commonwealth troops would now have to do the bulk of the fighting on the Western Front until the Americans were ready. The fighting spirit of the British and Commonwealth soldiers was to be severely tested during 1917. At Vimy Ridge, the Canadians showed that they had overcome their terrible experience at Ypres the year before by taking this important objective. Some 12 kilometres northeast of Arras, Vimy Ridge gained early importance during the war on account of the heights which overlooked the Allied-held town. German forces seized control of the ridge in September 1914 and promptly constructed deep defensive positions comprising of bunkers, caves, passages and artillery-proof trenches heavily protected by concrete machine gun emplacements. With such formidable defences in place, the German army rapidly set about the steady destruction of Arras, pounding the town with heavy artillery, apparently with impunity. French attempts to grab control of the ridge throughout 1915 were bloodily repulsed with the loss of some 150,000 French casualties. Although the British relieved French operations in March 1916, they were pushed back along a two kilometre front before they could commence planning their recapture. As part of this offensive, the Canadian Corps, operating under British General Julian Bing, were tasked with the recapture of Vimy Ridge. In preparation for this, the Canadians constructed miles of tunnels through which troops could pass in readiness for the opening of the attack without coming under shell fire. Aerial reconnaissance using observation balloons ensured accurate news of German movements. At dawn, on the morning of the 9th of April 1917, Easter Monday, the Canadian attack by four divisions began, supported by a well-devised creeping barrage. In the weeks leading up to the attack, there had been a heavy barrage by British artillery to soften up the enemy's defences. Within 30 minutes, through a swirling snowstorm, the Canadian 1st Division under Arthur Curry had succeeded in capturing German frontline positions. Within a further half hour, the second line had also passed into Canadian hands. With the entire ridge wholly under Allied control by the 12th of April, the operation was judged a spectacular success the single most successful Allied advance on the Western Front in four years. Vimy Ridge remained in Allied hands for the remainder of the war, but it did not come without cost. Over 10,600 Canadians were wounded during the attack and over 3,500 killed. The opposing German force suffered even more heavily with 20,000 casualties. Further north, the Allied successes continued. The Battle of Messine was the most successful local operation of the war, certainly on the Western Front. Carried out by General Herbert Plummer's Second Army, it was launched on the 7th of June 1917, with the detonation of 19 underground mines underneath the German trenches. The target of the offensive was the Messine Ridge, a natural stronghold southeast of Ypres. 
and a small German salient since late 1914. The attack was also a precursor to the much larger Third Battle of Ypres, also known as Passchendaele. General Plummer had begun the planning to take the Messine Ridge in early 1916. Meticulous in approach, Plummer preferred to plan for limited successes rather than gamble all on a significant breakthrough. In preparing for the Messine battle, he had authorised the laying of 22 mine shafts underneath the German lines all along the ridge. It took 18 months to dig the tunnels. The detonation of all 22 mines was scheduled for 0310 in the morning of 7th of June. Whilst the Germans were still dazed, the explosions were to be followed by infantry attacks supported by artillery bombardments, tanks and gas. In the face of active German countermining, 8,000 metres of tunnel were constructed under German lines. Occasionally, the tunnelers would encounter their German counterparts engaged in the same task, and hand-to-hand -hand fighting deep underground would follow. A heavy preliminary bombardment of the German lines by artillery began on the 21st of May. 2,300 guns and 300 heavy mortars were available for the opening barrage. At 02.50 on the morning of 7th of June, the firing stopped. The German troops, sensing imminent attack, rushed to their defensive positions, machine guns ready, while sending up flares to detect British movement towards the ridge. Silence prevailed for the following 20 minutes, until at 03.10 the order was given along the line to detonate the mines. Of the 21 mines laid, 19 were detonated. Any loss of surprise by the use of a preliminary bombardment was entirely offset by the effect of the mines. The crest of the Messine Ridge was completely blown off. The explosion was so big it was audible in Dublin and by David Lloyd George in his Downing Street study. The impact of the detonations on the German defenders was devastating. Some 10,000 men were killed in an instant. In its wake, nine divisions of infantry advanced under protection of a creeping artillery barrage, tanks and gas attacks. All initial objectives were taken within three hours. Reserves from General Goff's 5th Army and the French 1st Army reached their own final objectives by mid-afternoon. German troops counter-attacked on the 8th of June, but without success. In fact, they lost further ground as the attacks were repelled. German counter-attacks continued, but in less strength, until the 14th of June, and by this stage, the entire Messines salience was in Allied hands. The Messine battle greatly boosted morale among the Allies, not least because it was the first time on the Western Front that defensive casualties actually exceeded attacking losses. Encouraged by the success, Haig pushed to launch a new offensive in Flanders as soon as possible. Whereas the first and second battle of Ypres were launched by the Germans in 1914 and 1915 respectively, the third battle of Ypres in 1917 was intended as a breakthrough. Although officially called the third battle of Ypres, the horror that it became is more often known simply as Passchendaele.
Haig had long mulled the idea of launching a major offensive in Flanders. It was his preferred choice for 1916, although in the event the Battle of the Somme took precedence that summer. Meticulously planned, 3rd Ypres was launched on the 31st of July 1917 and continued until the fall of Passchendaele village on the 6th of November. The offensive resulted in gains for the Allies, but was by no means the breakthrough Haig intended, and such gains as were made came at great cost in human casualties. The aim of the campaign was the destruction of the German submarine bases on the Belgian coast. A warning had been issued by First Sea Lord Admiral Jellicoe that the current level of shipping losses would prevent the British from sustaining the war into 1918. Thus the submarine bases on the Belgian coast had to be cleared. Although Haig recognised the urgency of the situation, he was still locked into the belief that the German army was on the point of collapse, a belief that he had held since before the Somme offensive. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was opposed to the Passchendaele Offensive and later came out as highly critical of Haig's strategy and tactics in his published memoirs. But, in the absence of a credible alternative to Haig's plan, he felt obliged to sanction the offensive. With the obvious instability of Russian forces in the field and the possibility of their complete withdrawal from the war, action certainly appeared to be necessary in the summer of 1917. The Allies were worried that if the Russians were to leave the war, it would enable Germany to draft its eastern forces into the battle on the Western Front, dramatically increasing the German strength of their reserves. The Third Battle of Ypres was opened by Sir Hubert Goff's Fifth Army, with elements of Herbert Plummer's Second Army joining its right and a corps of the French First Army, a total of 12 divisions. As was becoming normal for any major Allied offensive, a preliminary bombardment by heavy artillery began for 10 days prior to the launch of the attack on the 31st of July. The bombardment used 3,000 guns, and over the next 10 days, they fired four and a quarter million shells. Given such an onslaught, the German Fourth Army opposing the Allies fully expected an imminent offensive. The element of surprise was entirely absent. Thus, when the attack was launched across an 18 kilometer front, the 4th Army was in place to hold off the main British advance around the Menin Road and restricted the Allies to fairly small gains to the left of the line around Pilkham Ridge. Similarly, the French were halted further north by the German 5th Army 
British attempts to renew the offensive over the course of the next few days were severely hampered by the onset of unseasonal heavy rains, the heaviest in 30 years, which churned the low-lying Flanders fields into thick, muddy swamps. Tanks found themselves immobile, stuck fast in the mud. Similarly, the infantry found their mobility severely limited. Ironically, the very force of the preliminary bombardment had itself destroyed drainage systems, making the problem worse. In addition, the artillery shells that rained down in the days prior to the attack had peppered the very ground that needed to be traversed by the advancing Allied forces. As the advance stalled, there was no shelter apart from what could be found in the shell holes. As a consequence, no renewed major offensive could be contemplated until August the 16th, when the Battle of Langemark saw four days of fierce fighting, during which the British made small gains at a cost of heavy casualties. Dissatisfied with progress, Haig replaced Sir Hubert Gough by sidelining him and his forces to the north. Whereas Gough favoured sweeping aggression, his replacement, Hubert Plummer, planned a series of small gains rather than all-out breakthroughs. The attacks began afresh on the 20th September with the Battle of the Menin Road Ridge. This was followed by the Battle of Polygon Wood on the 26th of September and finally the Battle of Broodsinder on the 4th of October. Taken together, these established British possession of the ridge east of Ypres. Encouraged by Plummer's small gains, while constantly pushing him to do more, Haig decided to continue the offensive towards Passchendaele Ridge, some 10 kilometers from Ypres. By now certain that the German army was approaching collapse. Little progress towards this end was made at the Battle of Polkapel and the First Battle of Passchendaele on the 19th of October and 12th of October respectively. The Allied attackers were themselves nearing exhaustion as German reserves released from the Eastern Front were poured into the ridge. To aid in their defence, the Germans made full use of mustard gas as opposed to chlorine gas used in the Second Battle of Ypres, which resulted in terrible chemical burns. Unwilling to concede that the breakthrough had failed, Haig pressed on with a further three assaults on the ridge in late October. The eventual capture of Passchendaele village by British and Canadian forces on the 6th of November finally gave Haig an excuse to call off the offensive while claiming a victory. The Third Battle of Ypres was, like its predecessors, a costly offensive. The British expeditionary force sustained some 310,000 casualties, with a similar if slightly lower number of German casualties. It was clear after the carnage of Passchendaele that there had to be a change of tactics if either side was to break the deadlock. At the Battle of Caporetto in October, the Austro-Hungarians, supported by their German allies, demonstrated the effectiveness of their new tactics when they inflicted a resounding defeat on the Italian forces. There had already been 11 battles along the Isonzo River, which is in modern-day Slovenia but with neither side scoring a significant victory. But the end of the Russian involvement in the war released many more divisions for the central powers of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
The terrain was especially hard as the fighting took place over mountains, ravines and narrow passes. Both sides were nearing exhaustion. The availability of so many new divisions gave the Central Powers one more opportunity to break the deadlock. Under German command, the attack began in the early hours of October the 24th with a short artillery barrage and gas attack. This was followed up by stormtroopers attacking weak points armed with new light submachine guns, hand grenades and flamethrowers. The Italians were taken by complete surprise and were soon in full retreat, with the German assault troops snapping at their heels. But the German supply lines, which were already stretched before the offensive began, now began to break down. The advance ground to a halt with the Italians digging in on the Piave River. Once again, the war settled into stalemate as both sides planned their next move. The difficulty for the Germans was overcoming their supply problems, made worse by their Allies' naval blockade. The Italians, supported by British and French troops, would have to mount a new offensive to drive the Germans back. Failure would leave the way open as far as Venice. In the last weeks of November 1917, the Allies tried out new tactics of their own. Key to the new offensive was the use of maps to pre-register artillery so that there would be no need for a prolonged opening barrage. This would mean that the opening attack would come as a complete surprise to the enemy. Secondly, tanks were to be used in a concentrated force in terrain that would play to their advantage. Although tanks had been used in Flanders, the soft, boggy ground left them at a huge disadvantage. Their effectiveness was beginning to be questioned. They were seen as too unwieldy and prone to mechanical failure. Indeed, the German high command, having overcome their initial alarm at the sudden appearance of the huge mechanical beasts, came to regard the tank with disdain, a device readily destroyed by the use of concentrated field artillery. Given such an attitude, it was hardly surprising that German tank development came relatively late in the war. Nevertheless, the British Tank Corps remained convinced that if used on firmer ground, the weapon would prove itself. Thus, Lieutenant Colonel John Fuller of the Tank Corps proposed a raid relying on the wide-scale use of tanks in an area that would demonstrate the tank's capabilities. The area chosen for the next offensive was Combray. Set in gently rolling countryside, it was also a key supply point for the Hindenburg Line. Fuller's proposal was promptly taken up by 3rd Army Commander Julian Bing, the commander on the ground, but was vetoed by British Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig, who preferred to continue with operations at Passchendaele. In time, however, Haig, disappointed at the lack of progress at Passchendaele, turned back to Fuller and Bing's scheme, attracted by the notion of achieving a useful victory using the new weapon before the year was out. The attack was launched at dawn on the morning of the 20th of November, with all available tanks advancing across a 10 kilometer front. 476 tanks were accompanied by six infantry and two cavalry divisions, who were able to exploit any breakthrough, plus a further 1,000 guns. <laughs> 
14 newly formed squadrons of the Royal Flying Corps stood by, a forerunner of the blitzkrieg tactics employed to great effect by the German army during the Second World War. As the artillery guns had been pre-registered, there was no preliminary bombardment which helped ensure the element of surprise. Within hours, the lightly defended Germans were forced back some six kilometers to Cambrai. Three trench systems of the Hindenburg Line were pierced for the first time in the war. Approximately 8,000 prisoners and 100 guns were captured on the first day alone. Much encouraged and greatly surprised by the notable gains on the first day, Haig determined to press on with the attack. But once the initial surprise had passed, British gains proved much harder to come by. Unfortunately, a lack of support to follow up the initial surprise breakthrough of the first day resulted in a loss of momentum. Despite their initial surprise, the Germans began pressing home wave after wave of counterattacks using around 20 divisions. The Germans had also devised new tactics using stormtroopers to smash their way through the weak points. These troops would continue going forward while others followed up and fanned out to catch the defenders off balance. Within a week, virtually all the lost ground had been reclaimed. During the battle, casualties were high. The Germans suffered losses of approximately 50,000 and the British 45,000. If ultimately the mass deployment of tanks had failed to achieve a desired breakthrough, it had nevertheless demonstrated the tank's potential in offensive operations. In Britain, News of the initial spectacular breakthrough was greeted with celebrations and the ringing of church bells for the first time during the war. Even though the success was short-lived, the Allies learned a great deal about tactics using combined arms. They also learned that the Germans were unlikely to be defeated by one single mighty blow. Instead, they would be attacked up and down the line to keep them off balance. But the Hindenburg Line was to remain impenetrable almost to the end, as it was not until late September 1918 that the Germans began withdrawing. The irony was that the very thing that was meant to provide strength became a source of weakness. There were many soldiers and civilians back home who regarded the withdrawal of 1917 as a retreat that all the sacrifices of the previous three years had been in vain. The burning of towns and villages, shooting of livestock and deporting civilians into forced labour made for bad propaganda, both at home and internationally. By the end of 1917, both sides were locked in a race against time. The Royal Navy's blockade of German ports left civilians starving and frontline troops short of food and replacement uniforms. But the American Expeditionary Force was now in France. Scheduled to reach up to three million men in size, the Germans also realised that decisive action was needed before the Americans were ready to join the fight. 1918 would be the decisive year for both sides. <laughs>